Radioheads. I'm Jenny Feldy here with Brooke Jones, the author of this book, Why Are There Monkeys and Other Questions for God? So I truly enjoyed this book. I loved it. I am terrified of flying and it helped to get me through a flight from Florida the other day while I was shaking and I cried on both flights. So thanks for providing some distraction and comfort and meaning because I was thinking about the meaning of life while I thought I might die. So here we are with the author, Brooke Jones. She's been on the radio for 30 years. Um, pff, could you just sum up what, what this book is about for future readers? I highly recommend this book. Well, thank you for that. I certainly appreciate it. And thanks for inviting me, Jenny. This is very cool. Why are there monkeys and other questions for God? This book is a true story. I was 25 years old once upon a time, a long time ago, and I was a stupid 25 year old. And basically, I don't think 25 year olds come in any other variety. But <laughs> yeah, I agree. Um, I had a party and I did something really stupid and I overdosed and mm. I was legally dead for eight minutes. And this was back in 1975 and I'd never even heard of near-death experiences, never even heard the term. So when I found myself floating in what is now the iconic tunnel of light, I didn't know what was going on. And I found myself at the proverbial front door of heaven, even though I didn't see a door. And I had a question and answer session with God. And I didn't believe in God at the time that it happened. So it took a while for me to wrap my head around what was going on. But I was given undeniable proof that what I experienced actually happened. So I wrote it all down. And it's now a book called Why Are There Monkeys and Other Questions for God. And it's about the question and answer session I had with God in which I asked every question I could think of. And God actually gave me the answers. Yes. Very interesting. And uh well, this will sound like I'm bragging, but I don't mean to brag, but it, it happens a lot, which is why an ex-boyfriend used to call me Trump. Um, a lot of God's <laughs> answers are my answers to people and things I say. So uh, I guess I got a lot in common with, with the God that you met. <laughs> that was very interesting. And I would say, so you met God, what was that like? Or should we just say, read the book? Uh, well, you know, I have seen a million interviews with authors who are asked questions and they say, well, read the book, right. which is frustrating to me because why did you do the interview if you were just going yeah. but, to But it is know, a long answer, so just read the book. <laughs> yeah, it takes less than two hours to read this book because it is very short. And in July, it was Amazon's number one bestseller, which is wow. kind of cool. Um, oh, yeah. I I uh, forgot the question. <laughs> <laughs> so you met God. What was that like? I mean, oh, it was many you. things. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's kind of a stupid question, but I thought I'd throw it in there. <laughs> oh, it's a great question. And considering that I didn't believe in God when it first happened, it was pretty shocking to me. But the first thing I learned was that God has a sense of humor. Mm -hmm. And I at first was sort of flabbergasted by that. And then I thought, well, wait a minute. Um, have you ever seen a platypus? Obviously, God has a sense of humor. Uh, and it also, I was really curious as to why I wasn't terrified. I never mm -hmm. saw God. He would not, she, I use the word he, but not he, not she. And so I'm just using the word he because it's easier than he, she, they, them, both, neither. You know, it takes up less space. Um, I heard God's voice, but I didn't hear it with my ears. I mm -hmm like I was a tuning fork and every sound God made literally vibrated throughout mm -hmm. my entire body and God laughs and God laughs a lot. Why wasn't I scared? I should have been terrified, shouldn't I? Well, I thought about that a lot when I came back and it occurred to me that if Robin Williams or Mr. Rogers could portray a loving, amusing, gentle, kind, father figure, certainly God could do that, couldn't mm -hmm. he? What would be the purpose of God wanting to scare me to death? There, there's mm -hmm. no upside to that. There'd be no reason for it. So I wasn't frightened because God wasn't frightening to mm -hmm. me. And that actually makes sense to me. God is, in fact, a very loving spirit. The entire universe is made of the love 
that emanates from this, whatever you call it. He doesn't care what we call him either, by the way. I asked that question. That's, yeah, that's my next question. <laughs> I thought that was interesting. Allah, Yahweh, Jesus, Father, Lord, what do we call God? And mm-hmm. God's answer was, it doesn't make any difference. Man's name for me does not define me. You can call me whatever you like. Right. You may call me whatever you wish to call me. The name you choose is of no importance to me, which is often my answer when people say, oh, what's your name? I'll forget your name. I say, you can call me whatever you want. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what my name is. You call me Martha. I don't care. Really? Mm-hmm. Like, uh, So that's my next question. Uh, humans, I think, place too much importance on labeling themselves and others. So after meeting God, what things became less or more important to you? I think after, well, first of all, when I came back, I had to figure out how to live a life that was in harmony with everything that I learned. And that took a long time. And of course, the very first thing that I jettisoned from my life was any form of organized religion, because I learned very quickly when I asked God, you know, there's Judaism and there's Catholics and there's Protestants and there's Muslims and there's Hindus and the did to what religion are you? And God said, I'm no religion. I said, well, which religion is the religion? And God said, "Uh, none of them. And then God said something really remarkable to me. God said, religion is a man-made concept that was Mm -hmm. created by men for the sole purpose of controlling other men. Mm -hmm. And religion has nothing to do with me, meaning God whoa, that that was mind boggling to me. So I came back and I learned, okay, if religion of any organized form has nothing to do with a relationship with God, then how do I live my life in harmony with all of that? And that took a long, long time. But now I am at the point where I actually recognize that God is everything. God is everywhere. God is in everything you, me, this table, this computer, God is in all of it. We discussed creation and evolution, and he told me that they're not mutually exclusive. And to Mm -hmm. boil it all down into simple terms, everything that was created evolves. Mm -hmm. Everything that evolves was created, and they are not mutually exclusive. And as an example, Lisa, think about your own life. Before you were born, you were just a bunch of cells that were created, by daddy sperm, mommy right. egg, got together, formed a fetus, you were born, and over the years you grew and became an adult human. That is an example of both creation mm-hmm. and evolution, and both of those exist. And God, the creator of everything, is in everything, just as an artist, a painter, for example, paint some of themselves in every picture that they paint. A writer, Mm -hmm. some of themselves in everything they write. And no artist in the world will deny that. Therefore, Mm -hmm. I see God in everything, in trees, in my dogs, in my cats, in absolutely everything. And that is probably the overriding change in me, Mm -hmm. personally, that God is everywhere. And the... Uh, very, very common Buddhist phrase, namaste, that means basically I recognize the um, spirit, the ultimate spirit in you. That applies to everyone and everything. And if all of us began to recognize that we are all made of God's love, if we realized that God is everywhere and that there is no Catholicism or Protestantism or Judaism or Islam, that there is only one God, no matter who you pray to, you're talking Mm -hmm. to the same being, perhaps there will be a whole lot less hatred in this world. Yeah, I, I've been following that for most of my life or all my life and been to church and temples and learned a bit from multiple religions, but I'm going to jump right to the end and go back to the middle. So at the very end, um, God it seemed like God was kind of contemplating whether to let you back into the real world. It was kind of like, it seemed like in the book, uh, but so don't, don't, don't give up the final question. Okay. Oh, okay. Cause not reveal. 
how well, how can how can we serve God? Um, that's up to every individual human being. Um, and right. how you choose to serve God is about how you define your relationship with God and how you define the, whatever gifts you were given. And everybody has gifts. And they are of all different sizes and shapes and configurations, but everybody has them. And I would, if I had to say, how can we all serve God? I mm -hmm. would say, just accept that everybody that you meet is your brother or your sister. Everybody, without exception. Right. Definitely. My days go better when I have that mentality. And sometimes I forget, you know, I think as humans... Maybe we're meant to forget. That's one theory, but we forget some things. And I think I forgot for like a week or two. And then I was like, no, we're, we all can help each other. And my days just go better. I mean, my yeah. luck increases. Uh, do you have any thoughts on karma after, after this encounter? Oh, well, or do you believe I, in karma? Or? I absolutely believe in karma. And to not believe in karma is to deny physics because karma mm -hmm. is nothing more than a restating of the most fundamental laws of physics. That which goes around comes around. Mm -hmm. What you get out, you get back. That, that's just the basic law of physics. Nothing happens of its own accord. Everything, this is, this is a causal universe we live in. Nothing happens by itself. And mm -hmm. even if don't understand the reason for something that doesn't mean that there isn't a reason right what you do what you give does come back to you and if you think about it in purely scientific terms we are made of energy we look like we're sitting still but we're not we're made of atoms every part of us is made of atoms everything you see is made of atoms and atoms don't sit still they mm -hmm. move they vibrate they have a frequency and every feeling that you have radiates outside of you to the environment. Your anger radiates at a certain frequency. Your love radiates at a certain frequency. And as you radiate whatever that emotion is, you are affecting the universe. You are mm -hmm. affecting those immediately around you and those down the street and down the block and on the other side of the planet. You think that what can one person do? I'm just me. Well, every single human being can affect the entire world by mm -hmm. just recognizing that what you do, what you say, what you think, what you feel does in fact have an effect on the environment and mm -hmm. on the people around you. So there's some meaning there. Um, so meaning, I think, well, society clearly has placed a lot of meaning on sex and mating. And I've also, I've often thought, and I think many of us have, what would my life look like? What would everyone's life look like if people didn't mate recreationally? So I'm going to quote your book. The human urge to mate has caused considerable problems over the years. So <laughs> any thoughts on if we took mating and sex out of the picture, what do you think this world would look like? Well, if we, if we took mating out of the picture, then minus human... reproduction, recreational mating. Okay. Yeah, um, recreational. So we're talking if there were no recreational. Yes. Um, I'd be a lot of frustrated people running around. I, <laughs> I, I don't know. I think that we were given the urge to mate because we needed to make sure that the population was going to continue and that the human race wasn't going to die out. Mm -hmm. I know that when you add sexuality to a relationship it dramatically changes the relationship mm -hmm. but that also is directly tied to the energy that's involved it's a totally different form of energy that you are bringing into the relationship and um for those who are celibate and there are millions who are there's a great deal of energy in sexuality mm -hmm. and if you are not sexually active you have a great deal of energy to place somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And who's where to place it? It's up to you. But that right. energy, yeah. And it's a creative energy by its very nature. It's a creative energy. So you do with it what you choose. And if you choose wisely, you make this world a better place. And I have to tell you, I have received more emails from readers than I can count who have said, I was raised to believe that my God and my religion are the only God and the only true religion. And anybody who believes differently is a heathen who deserves damnation in the fire. That's a great marketing tactic. 
Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Well, after reading my book, they said to me, they now find it very difficult to deny their kinship with people of other religions. Right. Can you imagine what would happen if enough people actually read this book? Mm-hmm recognized that same reality this world we live in that is so fueled by hatred could become a world that is filled with tolerance right and there have been i mean centuries of killing in the name of god and people hating in the name of god well if that stopped because people recognized that they are all brothers and sisters that killing that hatred might end Mm -hmm. And the world would be a very different place, which is why I have said, and readers have said, I hope this book becomes a huge bestseller because if it does, this world could be a much kinder place. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm technically Jewish. My mom's Jewish, but it just never made sense to me from a very young age. I dropped out of Hebrew school. I think I went to two or three years because they say you're the chosen one. Now I've always had friends of all different colors and I have a lot of male friends as a female and all different religions. I, I think it's very interesting. I'm just attracted to it. I'm attracted to different people. But uh, the chosen one, I'm like the chosen one. So, so what happens? The Muslims are chopped liver. The Christians are chosen. Like, how could you walk around thinking you're chosen? What about, what about my friends? What about some of my favorite people? They're not chosen. How could I walk around thinking I'm chosen? Like what? That's uh, to me, that's, that's a crazy way of thinking. Question. Here's one question that all of those chosen people have failed to ask because they're afraid of the answer what is it you were chosen for mm -hmm. okay hmm. so, think about that okay you can be the chosen people if you want do you know what you were chosen for right that's a good question exactly. we've got the answer to that you know when you figure like that, that out come back let's talk now you're like God in the book. You're asking, answering questions with a question although I don't think he answered with questions but he did answer them very mysteriously Yes, intentionally, I believe, because he, she, they, them, both, neither wanted me to think. Mm -hmm. And that is an important part of being human. We were given a brain. We should use it. Definitely. We free will. We should choose how we act and we should make wise choices. And those choices should be based on how do we help? one another mm -hmm. how do we act in a way that does not cause pain how right. do we act in a way that shows compassion how do we act in a way that helps those who need help mm -hmm. that's what free will is for i'm convinced of it right you can, as god told me you can make whatever choice you want i gave you free will you're free to choose whatever action you like i'm free to mete out some consequences but go right ahead choose whatever you like mm -hmm. i choose now to make wiser choices than i made before right when you know better you do better i guess my final question will be you're getting to the end so i've always also been someone that questions authority i've been raised probably from my dad and i've had family that has worked for the world bank and cdc etc other institutions. So when you see and you hear from the people that run things in this world, it's hard to take things too seriously, at least for me. So, you know, you've been a big questioner of authority. Um, are there any authorities that you question more nowadays? I mean, 2020 and 2021 has been crazy. Or are there any things that you don't question? You say, nope, this is definitely something I trust. Uh, that's not an easy question. No, it's not. It's a, it's a very hard, long. And, and, and I can't answer it as quickly as you want me to, because there are things about me that are a little unusual, like the fact that I have experienced at least seven different things in my life that there is no excuse. There is no explanation for why I survived. Mm, that okay. I died and nobody, nobody has been able to tell me why I didn't including hmm. decapitation from the 1994 LA earthquake, which wow. I didn't get decapitated only because a voice in my head told me to move right now. Quick. Hmm. If I had stayed in that chair a half a second longer, I would have been decapitated. There's no explanation. Wow. I was trapped in an elevator with two killers. I, my, the voice in my head said, get 
out just as the elevator doors were about to close. Where did that voice come from? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Out, And I learned five minutes later that a woman had been killed in that elevator a week before her body had been found in a dumpster. Her throat had been slashed and the two guys who did it matched the description of the guys I was traveling with. So as I said, there are things about me that are a little peculiar. I I really, (laughs) uh, thank you. I obviously was born with some awareness that I still am learning to deal with, but I have come to the realization that that voice, that intuitive voice that talks to me that has saved my life no less than seven times is to be trusted no matter what my brain tells me. Mm -hmm. To trust that intuitive voice is very difficult, but I now know, no matter what my brain says, if my intuitive voice or what people call my gut speaks differently, that's the voice I listen to, not Mm -hmm. the information I get on the internet, not the information I read, not the information my brain is telling me to, but the voice in my gut, because I know that that intuitive voice in me is directly linked to the voice, the power, the creation of the universe. And that can never be wrong. Trust the gut. Yep. And 37, anytime I've gone against my gut and I look back in hindsight on my original thoughts on people or a job, I say, I knew it. I knew it. So I guess the final thought would be trust your gut. See if you help people make you feel how situations and places and don't ignore it. <laughs> don't ignore it. And uh, the final that's body, that's your body responding to the vibration. Mm-hmm the energy around you that's your body hearing the voice of the creator always trust it it will never ever be wrong Mm. yeah i gotta say i gotta say so my shallow answer there it's 628 and final where can we find you your website your social media i have a whole bunch of social media sites i have a website written by brooke jones.com brooke has an e on the end of it and it's all one word and on that website you will see a little video called her story that's the story of my many years in radio in los angeles and san francisco and my fight with breast cancer and a whole bunch of other things um i do memes on a, a site called camp meme day um, i used to be a political satirist on stage Uh, But since cancer, instead of stand-up comedy, now I do sit-down comedy, and I create political satire memes, and you can find them at facebook.com slash camp meme a day. And lately, I've started creating memes that talk. Mm. That's fun. Um, I have a blog, whatif.com blog but if you go to my website written by brookjones.com there are links there to everything including my youtube channel and my blog and my line of greeting cards which are the most twisted greeting cards you have ever seen cardboard greetings and they're at the card outlet but again my website written by brookjones.com will take you to all of those places and the one other thing i must say is because surviving breast cancer is one of the many things that i survived that there's really no explanation why, uh, because I wasn't diagnosed until it was pretty far along. Mm. But I give a portion of everything that I do from the sale of this book to the sale of my greeting cards to the Breast Cancer Research Foundation. Yes, that. Oh, very nice. Thank and other questions for God. And a Every a percentage of every single sale of the book goes to the Breast Cancer Research Foundation. And if anybody wanted to contact me, ask me a question, comment on the book, you can go to my website, written by brookjones.com. And at the bottom of the page, there's a contact form and you can send me a message. And I work really hard to respond to the emails that I get. I get a lot of them, but I, I like answering them. And you're very busy. Looks like Perhaps you are serving God. (laughs) So my last question to the audience, rhetorical question, you can ask this to yourself. How can I serve society? How can I serve God? I hope you enjoyed Brooke Jones. I certainly did. I love the book. And now back to more. It came from the radio. And.